this is just a project I've been working on for about a year now. It's a induction furnace in the building. It goes up to 20 kilowatts maximum maximum power in it. What you see here, right here is the um, the actual work coil where the crucible will sit in, and down here is uh, where the crucible will sit, and then this platform raises up and goes into the work coil out in the front to melt the metal. And this is a uh, this is going to be open source project. So I'm going to release it pretty soon once I verify that it works 100%. The audio in this video is going to be pretty bad because my um, external mic ran out of batteries. So what you've seen here is the electronics box. Uh, I guess we can start from over here and work our way around. Maybe. Um, here's a 15 volt power supply. Uh, this is an oscillator board to generate the actual signal which will um, be alternating in this coil right here. It consists of a TL494CN uh, chip which is a dual PWM uh, generator with non-inverted inverting outputs. And then that feeds into a MOSFET driver which, um, which goes through this uh, uh, transformer right there and that drives the gates on these IGBTs on this other board right here. And then that again goes through a transformer. It's a, like one winding in, like four four windings out kind of transformer. Um, I can, I'm going to explain it more in detail on the blog, I think. Um, this is kind of just overviewing the, the circuit. And then it goes into the giant IGBTs right there. And then finally through this main transformer which couples through the LC tank circuit. Um, this is the um, LC tank capacitor. And then that fold forms an LC tank circuit which um, can reach in our, in our earlier test, it was reaching up to 150 amps on that circuit, and probably more once we go to a higher power level. It's a pretty fancy capacitor right there. It's the C500T by Selim. It's a 3 microfarad, 750 volts, 800 amp capacitor. So this, this uh, transformer is a 20 to 1 step down converter, uh, step down transformer. So there's one turn is this copper pipe and there's 20 turns of fire on the transformer. The diameter of the wire might need to be bigger on that. On this other side we have our uh, the three phase input Here's the contactor, and up here is like the 120 volt circuit that can that engages this contactor, that engages the relay to, to close the, the contacts on there. And after the contactor, there's a three, fa three, three phase bridge rectifier, and then it goes into the bulk capacitor down there. And then that, this switch gets uh, switched into the high frequency AC um, on those with those IGBTs. And then over here we've just got a microcontroller which monitors the temperature of the water, it monitors if the water is flowing, and also monitors uh, if the crucible has been broken or not. And the way it does that is I've got this, I'm going to put two screens down in the front of here which are not installed yet, right here, really close together. And if the crucible were to break, metal would fall out and make contact with both the screens, creating a dip in the voltage, which gets uh, latched by this uh, latch, 7-4 series latch, 
which then notifies the microcontroller to shut to shut the system down using this um, microcontroller controlled relay. And then the microcontroller goes into a um, it it uh, pretty much stalls, so you have to hard you have to hard reset it to be able to engage the relay again. So that's like a little safety feature, so it doesn't just automatically start up and cut out all the time, which would be pretty bad if that happened. Okay, and this on the back there's a control panel, which has the uh, three-phase circuit breaker on it. This is a three-amp circuit breaker. We're using uh, 208 volt three-phase. Uh, power coming out of the wall. Can't remember what connector we're using, but it's uh, one of the NEMA connectors. And down here we have the air pump that controls the crucible lifting, which is just a bike pump that we, that we used. It's a 12 volt bike pump. And right here we've got needle valves to um, either allow air to go to the, cru the, to the crucible lifter or there to release of the atmosphere to lower the crucible. And we've just got the switches and key switches, indication lights, uh, a three-phase current meter, which is only looking at one phase, but the phase's current draw will be balanced. You can just look at one phase and kind of extrapolate what the other phase would be doing, too. And then Right here we've got the frequency switch, or the frequency potentiometer, it's a 10 turn potentiometer, which uh, you can set the frequency down from 3 to 30 kilohertz, and moving us, oops, oh, let's try that again, and moving the switch to the up position, you can get 30 to 300 kilohertz, just, it changes the capacitor value in the oscillator circuit so you get a you can change which frequency range you want to go to and that could be good for melting steel the resonant frequency of the coil uh, is significantly reduced if you have steel in the crucible versus uh, aluminum so this is like the aluminum range and then this is steel range although we still have to figure out what we've estimated the range but it could be in real world different than what we've calculated. And then also you've got a dead zone potentiometer which controls um, the time in between the, the positive and negative pulses. And these two BNCs will just be monitoring the output waveform coming off the big IGBTs. And they'll be going through a 10 to 1 uh, voltage divider just because It'll be 30 volts versus 300 volts out of that port, and that uh, might blow, it, blow up some of the oscilloscopes if it's not ready for that. And finally, on the back here, we've got the radiator, which is water cooling the coil. You can see these lines um, coming in over the copper tubing, and also it cools the IGBT uh, bricks right here. And these are 400 amp IGBT bricks. And I think they're ready for 650 volts. What you see on top of them are snubber capacitors, which provide the high current surges that it needs to to switch this coil. Okay, what's underneath is there's a this is a, all underneath here is a water cooling setup. So here's the, the reservoir, which is just a two two gallon bucket, and we've also got a, a pretty nice motor down there. It's a diaphragm motor, made by Aquatech, and it runs continuously without without fail. So and then we just got an inline filter down there too, a 50 mesh inline filter to prevent any metal particulates from uh, possibly wrecking the motor. And we've just got our standard ATX power supply down there, supplying 12 volts for the radiator fan and also for some of the circuitry in the electronic box. And then you've just got a standard 12 volt or a standard 120 volt distribution strip right there. 
uh, this cable uh, coming out of it is a uh, pretty, pretty hefty cable. It doesn't need to be this big, but we've, we just found it lying around. It's about 50, 50 feet. This is a six gauge, a four wire cable. Uh, we could have gone by it with 10 gauge cable, but this is just what was lying around in the university. So this will be released pretty soon to the open source community. Some of the design is based off the MIT. They did an instructables page where they uh, made a, a similar induction furnace. I will link it in, in the description if you haven't seen it before. This should be pretty cool when it comes out. I'm going to have more videos of it in our testing phase just to document the progress of this and hopefully melt some metal with it in the future. Uh, the metal we'll be melting is mostly going to be aluminum. Uh, we're do making this for creating open source metal 3D printer filament. So there'll be um, some of the researchers will come in and use this uh, induction furnace to create their their special alloy to make metal 3D printing alloys. The schematics and the design paper will be available pretty soon, I think once we verify that this works. Hopefully I'll get a video out soon that shows it melting some metal if everything goes good. See you later.